So I changed the title of the deck slightly uh, from can we uh, hack open source cloud platforms to save the planet to make it a little more realistic to can we hack open source cloud platforms to reduce emissions. Uh, so I, I think that's probably a little more realistic and uh, uh, probably a more appropriate title. And also I've uploaded this deck to SlideShare already so it's also more likely to be found for what the talk is about as opposed to saving the planet. So with that, um, hi everyone, uh, that's my details. Um, <clears throat> I apologize for the bullet points in the slide. Uh, this is the only slide that has bullet points. Uh, so the, the important ones to take away are uh, email address, phone number, uh, Twitter, and SlideShare. As I say, the deck is already up in SlideShare. Uh, last time I checked, I put it up this morning, it's had about 140 views so far. Uh, a couple of people have retweeted it. Thanks, Andy, and anyone else who did. <clears throat> so, with that, on to the talk. Um, Gareth Fitzgerald was an Irish politician. Uh, died last year. Uh, a highly influential figure, was prime minister of the country twice in the 80s. Um, he, as well as being a politician, had a huge, huge amount of integrity, was very highly thought of. He was probably, um, for a politician, incredibly unusual in that he had a bit of a uh, charisma deficit. Uh, he was a, um, an academic, so a real head in the clouds kind of guy. How he ever became, how, how he ever became elected is you know, beyond my, my understanding, but he did. Uh, before he became a politician though, <clears throat> he worked in, uh, and Drew introduced it nicely, he worked in data science and statistics. And in 1949, Aeroflot published their uh, schedule for the first time. And Garrett Fitzgerald took a look at their schedule and realized that from that, he could figure out the exact size and number and types of airplanes that Airflot had in their fleet. And this was a huge, huge state secret in Russia. No one had ever done this before. Garrett Fitzgerald figured it out and published it. And as a result, the KGB had a file on him. And uh, he was thought to be a spy for a while until they figured out that no, actually, he had figured, figured it out statistically and they had, they had messed up. Um, what's, what's interesting about that and where I'm going with this is that there is no such thing as security by obscurity. It just doesn't work. Someone will hack it and figure it out. And what's also interesting about this particular slide is when I went looking for a slide with a KGB logo, I found one with a cat on it as well. So <laughs> no such thing as security by obscurity, and yes, the internet really rocks. <laughs> so one of the big problems with cloud computing is the lack of transparency that it has. And this is something I've talked about and blogged about several times, uh, or lo lots of times, in fact. I've given webinars about it. I've given talks about it before. Uh, it's, it's, it's an ongoing issue that I, I keep pushing because I think it's important. Now, recently, as in last week, the New York Times <coughs> picked it up as well and ran this long piece about uh, data centers and cloud computing. And it's, it's a very good piece. The, the, link, the, the link to all my um, <clears throat> data is in the bottom of the slides. As I say, the, the deck is up on SlideShare, and the, the links are clickable. So if you want to read the article, and I recommend you do if you're interested, it's, it's a really good article. Uh, it goes on in, in long detail. They got McKinsey in to do a study uh, on data centers and their energy. And uh, McKinsey found that the data centers, typically, the energy going to the computers only between, I think it was 9 and 12% of the energy going to the computers is actually used for computing. The rest is to keep the computers running uh, in case there are bursts of activity on the computer. So you know that E in EC2, the elastic? That's where all the energy is. That's where 80%, 88% of the energy is for elasticity in the cloud. Now, one problem that that article and lots of people in the space make is worrying about energy. Energy isn't the issue. The issue is the emissions that come from that energy. So a good example of this is Facebook's 
newest data centre, the newest one they opened, which is in Prineville in Oregon. Greenpeace had a big issue about this when it opened, and they hit, hit Facebook hard on it, and it, it worked really well. The issue is that Facebook's plant, or data centre, in Oregon is a massively efficient data centre. In fact, Facebook, in fairness to them, after Greenpeace came after them, Facebook open-sourced the design and build of the data centre. They put up a site called Open Compute. You may have heard of it. Uh, they've, so you can go there now and you can, you can see the schematics of the data centre and all the hardware that they use within it. So you can build your own Facebook data centre. It's got a PUE, which is a measure of data center efficiency, of 1.07, 1.08, 1 in or around there. It varies depending on time of year and things like that. Uh, and the industry standard is 1.5. The lower your PUE, the better, the more efficient your data center is. So, uh, and Facebook themselves say their uh, energy consumption per unit of computing has declined by 38%. So really, really good stuff, except they put it in Oregon where it's powered by a company called Pacific Core. And Pacific Core own nine coal mines. They mine 9.6 million tons of coal per annum to power their data center, or to, to, to power their grid. They also, uh, I think, if I remember correctly, and the numbers are on the, the notes of the slide, so you can get them in SlideShare, uh, they, have, they produce 58% of their energy directly from coal and another 12% from natural gas. So that's 70% from fossil fuels directly. They buy in something like 22.5% from other generators. And again, you're going to get a, about 70% of that being fossil fuels. So their energy is some of the dirtiest energy you can get. It's also cheap, which is probably why Facebook went there, that and the climate around there. So the point is, Facebook's opening their plant in Prineville, Oregon and, and putting it there, while it's massively energy efficient, it's also emitting huge amounts of CO2. Dublin in Ireland has recently become, in the last decade, has become a real hub for cloud computing. And lots of plants, uh, so Amazon are there, IBM are there, uh, Google are there, you know, all the big names have, have plants in Dublin. Problem with that, is that Ireland's electricity grid is 84% fossil fuels. London, as well, another big hub, their grid is about, it's in excess of 90% fossil fuel, the UK grid. So, big, big problems with the fact that in a lot of places you're citing your, 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 your data centers, your grid is mostly fossil fuels. There are exceptions to that. So Iceland, for example, is 100% renewable, and there are other places. And I'm, I'm, I, when I was talking about Facebook, they have changed their siting policy for data centers. So that now, when they're looking for sites for data centers, they look for places with high amounts of renewables on the grid. This is because we, we like data. This is a little bit of data to, to you know, explain the problem. So hope the audio can pick this up. The PUE column here is the, as I said, the efficiency of data centers. So a typical data center comes in around one and a half, PUE of one and a half. Uh, very efficient, desperately inefficient. If you have your typical uh, data center with your 1.5, uh, and it has a typical supply carbon intensity of half a kilo per kilowatt hour, then you're coming out with an IT carbon intensity of three quarters of a kilo, simple math, three quarters of a kilo per, ter per, per kilowatt hour. Now, if you have a very efficient data center with a PUE of 1.2, but it's in a place with a high amount of fossil fuels, you get a high IT carbon intensity of 0.96. If you get a desperately inefficient data center, but it's in a place with a high amount of renewables on the grid, you get a low carbon intensity for your IT. So where you're siting your data center and where it sources its energy is extremely important. This is a list of some of the cloud providers out there chosen completely at random by the availability of their logos by me for production of this slide. So of those, Rackspace and Google are two who have done reasonably well in t 
Oh, <laughs> the Redmond logos on all the slides, we're not a cloud provider. <laughs> <laughs> so Rackspace and Google have done reasonably well with their, with their data centers. Uh, Rackspace has one data center in the UK, uh, which is 100% renewable powered. Uh, it's on the UK grid, but they're buying in renewable energy credits, basically. So they're, they're buying renewable power, even though it's coming off the grid. Uh, Google have gone to a... a uh, Google have really gone the distance in doing things like buying wind farms and buying renewable energy credits and stuff like that. So they've, they've, they've done a fair bit to make their data centers as, as carbon neutral as possible. The other one there is Green Cloud. And Green Cloud are a, what they build themselves is a drop-in replacement for Amazon. <clears throat> so if you've got APIs for Amazon, they'll work on Green Cloud as well. Green Cloud have a, a unique proposition in that they're based in Iceland. So they're getting 100% renewable electricity. All, all energy in Iceland is 100% renewable. Uh, Iceland's a very strange case. Uh, they're, they're I, I think if I remember correctly, 70% hydro and 30% geothermal. So it's base load renewable. And there's 300,000 people roughly in Iceland, but they've got big aluminium smelting plants there. And the aluminium smelting plants pull about 500 megawatts a piece. And they run 24 seven, they never go down. They can't. So the draw on the Iceland electricity grid is flat. Day, night, summer, winter, it's flat because the population of Iceland, the 300,000 people, their draw is minuscule compared to the draw of the smelting plants. So it's just a flat line the whole time. And it's one of the most reliable grids in the world because the big consumers need it to be and that's why they're there. It's also some of the cheapest electricity in the world because it's renewable and it's base load and it's just coming on all the time. So, Green Cloud are based there, and that's why A, they're cheap, and B, they're fully green. Amazon claim that uh, they've got two regions which are 100% renewable. That highlighted piece of text there, it says, if you can't read it, it says that their Oregon and their GovCloud regions are carbon free. Having said that, when you ask them for details about it, they won't give you any. So Bruce Derling, this guy here, he asked, he asked Jeff, he said, you know, uh, what's the story? Uh, and he says, we, we, don't, we don't currently share the details, but I'm happy to hear you like it. And then Bruce goes on and says, mm, well, how can we verify it's true? There are lots of different ways to claim zero carbon. And then you hear crickets chirping. <laughs> Nothing, no more, went dead. So uh, there we come to the problem of lack of data. A lot of these, well, Almost none of the cloud providers are giving us data. There are a couple. So Salesforce and SAP, for example, do give a little bit of data. And if we look at sales, sorry, if we look at SAP's data, the only data they tell us is that their emissions from, from their cloud uh, centers, their emissions from their data centers come in at 8% of their, their whole emissions. That's the only data we get from SAP, 8% from all of their emissions, which doesn't tell us much. Salesforce give us a little more data, but it's the wrong data. They tell us how much carbon they save per transaction, but not how much they emit, which is next to useless because we don't know how much they emit then. And we can't, we can't work it back, or I can't work it back. Maybe Drew can help us there. <laughs> so. That's no good. They also uh, give us um, figures for if you're in this region and you have this many people, this is how much carbon you can save by going on our platform. But it's highly inaccurate, unfortunately. So for example, this one I chose, I chose a plant of uh, 10,000 people based in Europe uh, with an on-premise moving to the cloud, moving to Salesforce cloud. And it tells me that I can save 86% or 178 tons of carbon. But of course, that's complete baloney. Because if I'm based, as I am in Spain, where the grid is 40% renewable, or if I'm based in France, where the grid is nearly 80% nuclear, if I put my stuff from private into Salesforce, my emissions are going to go up, not down. And they're telling me it's going down by 86%. So huge, huge issues with the, with, with the data we're getting. Why don't they give us data? Well, part of it is 
competition, competitive intelligence. They don't want to be giving away the data. Part of it is they want to hide their emissions. They don't want bad PR. They don't want Greenpeace jumping down their throats. And part of it is there's a lack of standards around reporting this kind of stuff anyway. And of course, this is the uh, gratuitous beer logo that I had to get in here, seeing as we're at Monktoberfest. <laughs> Standard lager. <laughs> I told you the internet rocks. <laughs> These are all uh, Flickr um, images that you can do. If you go into the advanced search in Flickr, there's a Creative Commons tick. So you can just look for Creative Commons licensed images, and there you go. As I say, the internet rocks. We're all familiar with this expression, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. It's attributed to lots of different people, Peter Drucker and several other management gurus, and it probably goes back into the, the dawns of time. But it's true. It's an old saw, but it's true. If you're not measuring something, you can't manage it. And what are the outcomes of that? Well, if we have a quick recap of what's gone on just this year alone, 2012, we find that this is from last week, an image from the USDA. This is drought across North America, well, across the US. And you can see it's been one of the worst years for drought in US history. The figures for the third quarter are something like a $12 billion loss in crops from drought. Uh, we've had mad wildfires across the globe. We've had floodings which have killed scores of people. Uh, we've had heat records, 2,000 heat records in the last week of June alone, 3,500 heat records in the month of June alone, 3,500 heat records in the U.S. alone. This is, again, you can go through this data afterwards if you're going through the slides. It's a graphical representation, or it's a tabular representation, sorry, of the Arctic ice loss which is probably easier to understand on this chart. The blue line at the bottom is the Arctic ice sea extent for 2012, and it's the lowest it's ever been by almost orders of magnitude, but not quite. So the gray uh, shaded area is the 79 to 2000 uh, mean with two standard deviations. The lines underneath it are the years uh, 2005 is the first one down, 2007, which was the record up until this year, is the next one down, and the bottom one, as you can see, is this year. And this is a pictorial representation of it to show you the orange outside line is the 79 to 2000 mean. The white is this year. That's an image from uh, the 16th of September. The minimum this year was the 13th of September, so it's grown slightly by the time this shot was taken. Uh, also, uh, Arctic uh, ice loss leads to things like uh, methane fluxes coming out of the ice because uh, it's been trapped for a long time and now the ice is disappearing. So, fun stuff. Uh, cloud computing's emissions don't directly cause these issues. I know, I get that. They don't. Uh, but they do play a part. So we do need to tackle them. How can we do that? Well, there are open source cloud computing platforms. These are three of them that I know of. There are, there are more, I know. But these are the, the three main players. Feel free to correct me. Um, one solution that occurs to me should be possible is to fork some of these platforms. It's not something, I'm not a programmer, so this is not something I can do, but you guys, feel free. Fork some of these platforms and code in reporting for energy and emissions. Metrics and reporting, that's what, it, that's what, I, that's what they need. They need a way to have this display it, to measure it, and to report it as dashboards or whatever. There's a company in the UK called AME, A-M-E-E, -E, and they already have APIs for carbon reporting for this kind of stuff. So they'll, they'll make it easy for you. Then, having forked it, get it back into the core. Because if this is back in the core, question? Um, why is it necessary to fork rather than just uh, submit patches directly? 
Better? Okay. I, I know you know the process better than I do. I'm, I'm just throwing the idea out there. Okay, I'm just saying I don't think any of the any of the projects would say no. no we don't we don't want better. You know. Okay. Great. <laughs> okay. Great. So submit it through patches. Yeah, and get it get it into the core of the project. Absolutely. Because then, when it's distributed, the update is distributed. These are the com these are the client companies of Eucalyptus. This is the client companies of CloudStack. The client companies of uh, OpenStack, or the users of OpenStack, all these people get the updates with the reporting built in. And then we've got the measurement and reporting that we need to drive down the emissions through these, to, to these clouds. So, uh, by the way, there is this company also out of the UK called Mastodon C. They're a startup, and right now they're doing best guesstimates on some of the cloud platforms that are out there. So you can see there's a chart uh, showing where and roughly uh, clouds of data, uh, plus there's a, um, a table on the, on, the, on the far left with the amount of emissions coming from the various uh, data centers for the cloud providers. But it, those are guesstimates. Those are not necessarily accurate. Andy? Uh, actually, came out of the response to the London Green Hack in February yeah. That, that, so that, if you didn't hear that, if you didn't hear Andy's comment, this, this Mastodon C startup came out of a green hackathon sponsored by Amy, the company on the previous slide. So you can go there now and you can do it and they're hoping to have decent APIs and better data as they go along. So conclusion, we need to add the metrics and reporting to cloud computing to help reduce emissions. That's just a given. And the question is, is anyone up for it? Andy. Have you seen the thing about Manifest? Uh, I have. Yeah. I'm just surprised you provided it to me at the end. It's something that's kind of cool. It is, yeah. It is. Yeah, it is. So, no, it's, uh, it, it's, it's something, and I, I've, I've had conversations with uh, Bruce and uh, Francine and all these people about this, and it's something I've put to them. So, yeah, this is, uh, this, this is, a, this is a, uh, a serious question for you guys in the audience. This is something we need to be doing. So if anyone's up for it, please, please do. And as Andy said, the Clean Web, uh, the Clean Web Manifesto is out there as well. Google it, look it up, and uh, go for it. <laughs>